I'm gonna have my bullet. Where is it? Maybe I took it off. Oh, there it is. What is it? It's a bullet. So that I know that this, I know where this bullet is and I don't have to worry about it. It's around my neck. And it has an amethyst in it, which is my birthstone. Did it work so far? You never took any bullets? Real ones? Huh? It works? You, it protected you from real bullets so far? It, it gives you a sense of how fragile we are, you know, so that we don't have any illusions that we can't be killed. Because a lot of uh, photographers lately seem to think they're bulletproof. We're not bulletproof. And those civilians, they're not wearing vests. And we go into these situations and they get cut to pieces. And it's, uh, I think the most important thing is, is to do the job, get in there, document the, what's going on there, get the material out and so that the world sees what's going on. I have the greatest respect for Lon Vanderstock. He takes major risk, but at least he goes and tries to, with no fanfare, he just does it. He goes out there, gets it done, gets the material back, we see it, and we're able to make some kind of understanding of what's going on. Those are the journalists I respect. The ones that like want to play this game that they're superheroes, forget it. Sometimes you call them the um, merchants of misery. Not you, but the NGOs do that. But I know yeah. you're not very tender with the young, younger generation who are more like obsessed with technology than human. Do you know rights. that 9%, I heard 10, but who knows? But let's go with 9%. 9% of people rejected this year in world press because of cloning because of taking things out, because of adding things, because of enhancement. You know, it's like all of a sudden we've become these artists, but you can't, I don't care if you do it in fashion. You do it in fashion. You want to take a piece of lettuce out of uh, Sienna Miller's teeth, knock yourself out. But to take it, to make it an enhancement when somebody is like in a tragic situation just because you want to be an artist, Screw that noise. And that's my deepest problem, is we've lost our sense of, we've lost the moral path. You know, we've, we're not staying the course of why we're out there. We're out there to document what's happening to people, and we're out there to be honest. And we're not being honest, and we've lost our ethical, we've lost our ethics, and we have to get them back. Tell us a little bit about uh, the environment um, you grew up in and about your parents, you know, what were they doing? They were actors. Uh, my father was uh, one of the founders of the American Negro Theatre Wing. He was involved with the American uh, uh, Federation of Radio, Radio and Television Artists. Uh, he, was in, he was in the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, he was uh, a giant as uh, Ozzie Davis this also a great actor once said, you know, when people think about the black community and they think about these actors, they have to realize we have our Laurence Olivier's, we have our John Gilgoods, we have these people. And uh, Stanley Green, my father, was one of them. The problem is, is that the way it was in those times, not many people knew who he was, but those that knew, knew. You know, Clarence uh, Williams III, once when he got an award for his performance in Mod Squad, stood up and said, I want to thank Stanley Green because Stanley Green gave, me his, gave him his first start. There was lots of people, Diane Sands, Maxville, Glanville. I mean, many actors fell through the cracks during that period. The other thing, my father was a communist. Uh, not communist in a way, of, but communist in a thinking way. But unfortunately, during the 50s, during the witch hunts, during the McCarthy times, and during when Ronald Reagan was uh, head of Screen Actors Guild and uh, Ed Sullivan was head of Actors Equity, they, they did these witch hunts. And they, they forced actors out of, the, out of the business if they thought they were communists. And when it came to simple people like my father, they basically said to them, oh, admit that you're a communist, give us names. And my father says, I'm not giving you names. And the only thing you should care about is, uh, is uh, whether I give a good performance. 
And I know that quote has been used by other actors, but my father said it with conviction because that's what he believed, that no one had the right to talk about what he believed or gave. Because my father, he fought in World War II, and he was with Merrill's Marauders. They made a movie about it once. But what he did in Merrill's Marauders, they didn't document. He was the people, the burial squad that went behind them and buried those that got left behind. And even if they weren't dead, sometimes they had to just bury them. He had to live with that all his life. So you think he's going to let a Ronald Reagan or an Ed Sullivan stand up there and question his loyalty? My father is buried in a military cemetery in New York. He demanded that he be buried with full honors. He could have been buried in the family plot. This is a man that was a communist, but he believed in the country. He believed in America. He believed in the rights of men. He just was a philosophy for him, that's all. I mean, whether he knew who Joseph Stalin was or cared or Lenin, it was the philosophy of Marxism. But because of that, he was hounded out of the craft that he loved. And he kept that and put that inside of me. He said, he once said to me, you can't beat them, but you can beat them with your tap shoes and just tap them, dance on their heads. So that's it. When you find something wrong, you try to do it. Uh, Gordon Park said it better. He said it's a choice of weapons. You choose how you're going to fight these, uh, the evils in the world. How on earth do you go from the Black Panthers into diving into the craziness of the punk scene in San Francisco? They seem so opposite from the outside. Not really. I mean, what do you see, what do you see in common? Well, what's in common is, is that they're tribal. I mean, the punk movement in the beginning was tribal. I mean, it was, it was you had a group of individuals that were trying to say something and didn't know how to say it. And they found that through music, they could say it. Smashing guitars, they could say it. I mean, be real. Most of the people in the punk movement, they couldn't sing, they couldn't play, but they, they had something they had to say, something they had to scream, something they had to scratch. And that's what they did, and they found different ways. Look, most of the people in the early days of the punk movement were outcasts. I mean, when you look at the, the, the so-called superstars of the punk movement, they were ugly kids. They were people that, that were full of anger. They, they didn't know how to say anything. And, and through music, they found a way, and through art. And going to the San Francisco Art Institute, you had these misfit kids that were like being rejected all over the place. And all of a sudden, they look around, wow, over there, there's a person that looks like me. And there's a person that looks like me over there. And they come together, and they form bands. And because they feel so alienated, they take on names to make you be scared of them, calling themselves the mutants, the Avengers. You know, that all of a sudden they just realize that we have a power, we have a voice. And that's, the Panthers were the same. They, they decided that they were tired of being pushed around. They put on the leather jackets. The punks put on the leather jackets. They put on the berets, you know. It was like, yeah, it was all tribal. It was easy. Is there anything you didn't do during, during those wild punk years? Is there anything I didn't do? Like you mean in yeah, drugs? Excessive things, of course. I, it was an excessive time. Sometimes it was so excessive you didn't even knew, know you did it. <laughs> it was it? You know, there was a lot of things that were excessive. I mean, there was probably at a day of reckoning, someone will go, "Oh yeah, you did that," and I'll go, "Really? I don't really remember that, but maybe." Do you have a wildest memory? Huh? Do you have the wild, the wildest memory from this time? What the whitest? The wildest memory. Wildest memory? From this day. The wildest, me well, well, <laughs> I think the, the wildest memory was one time we didn't come out of a house for like a, a week. And when we came out, we, we were changed. I think that. That's very enigmatic. <laughs> I mean, that's all I can say. I, 
I mean, I can barely even remember it, but uh, there must have been something because it definitely changed me. So it must have been pretty wild. It must have gone too far, not far enough, whatever. But yeah, when I came out, I, I know that I got into my car and left San Francisco. That much I do know. So whatever went down, I, it gave me a reason to leave. And I didn't really imagine that I would ever leave. You know, I really, I loved San Francisco. You know, I was one of the founding members of Camera Work, so I could even play the straight part as well. I mean, I was like in and out of all the different worlds. So I was able to, uh, you know, yeah, I don't know. It was whatever happened that week, at, well, yeah, it was a week. It must have been really traumatic, and I just split. This is one of my favorite pictures, by the way. Why? Because uh, at the moment that I took this picture, I thought that we were all going to die. Because <laughs> Yeltsin had sent in his forces, and uh, it was like a, a moment of fate of accompli. Like we were told that they were going to kill everybody inside. And, uh, so they were preparing for the onslaught, the last, yeah. Can you tell the context for the people who don't know? So you're, this is 93? Three, October 93, yeah. What happened? So you're well, there was, the, there was the pooch in uh, the parliament. Uh, Yeltsin dissolved the parliament because he had some issues with uh, Rutskoy and uh, Habalapa. And uh, he, uh, it's more complex, it's super complex. Uh, Yeltsin was drunk, Yeltsin had made a deal with the oligarchs, uh, with the military. Um, I believe that the war in Chechnya was in, if you want, this was the, the seed that got planted that day when they made that deal, that they were going to take over the caucuses. And uh, I think that Yeltsin, it's, it's, there is documentary that has Yeltsin inside the Kremlin screaming, kill them all, wipe them out. Because he felt, uh, well, I mean, Yeltsin wasn't the angel that everybody wanted him to be just because he danced on a stage and he was friends with Clinton. I mean, these guys were like really bad. And uh, you had a mixture of fascist and orthodox and communist but they all had one thing in common. They all hated Yeltsin, and they wanted to overthrow the government. So in, a, in effect, it was a coup d'etat. The problem was is the means of putting down the coup d'etat was uh, almost barbaric. Firing on your own people, sending in tanks. They always say that they only killed, I think, a um, hundred and something. But in reality, they killed thousands. So who are those two people? Well, this is a uh, former uh, soldier who had crossed over. And uh, this is uh, a girl who is uh, lying on his uh, arm, waiting. They were all huddled together, waiting for the, uh, the crack unit that was being sent in, these guys, uh, to, uh, to kill him. And they thought they were going to be dot. They're going to be dead. And what I, what's incredible is just the 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 acceptance at that moment that. And so I'm huddled on the ground with them because it's taken from that. It's not me standing over them. And we all thought we were going to uh, not make it. And the fact that the only thing that made me take and it's Kodachrome was to take the picture was that I felt there should be, and this is not being heroic or anything, it was just, what else do you do? You have the camera, you're there, you think you're going to be killed, and the only thing that's left is to leave some documented proof of what happened there, and that's all it was. But the fact that I survived and, um, yeah. And if I hadn't survived, this picture hopefully would have. Did they survive? Yeah, I believe so. Nobody was really killed. There was, I think there was 21 people when they came in. 
the rest had given up. Diehards. I think there was like 21. Maybe maybe a little bit more. I was the only Westerner inside. And so, well, that's an interesting thing because uh, as I was being led out, uh, I took a picture, and as I was taking, I had the camera. We were all being huddled out, and it was chaos because then a sniper started to fire on them, and all of a sudden, uh, this photographer from Newsweek saw saw me, called my name, and they sort of smuggled me up past the, the soldiers. So somehow I got out. 